Let me, um, so let's make some introductory remarks. So um, open up, if you would, to the Catechism 1533. I want to try to walk through a set of things. The Catechism is really rich on this. We won't by any means cover the whole thing. We just don't have the time. Um, but it's really helpful. So maybe just 1533. So remember from last week, we just tried to step back quickly and look at um, seven sacraments, three of initiation. That's baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Two of healing, confession and anointing, and two of service. We looked at marriage last week, and priesthood's the other one. So flip to um, 1534 real quick. Look at 1534 and 1535. So the question came up at the break, I think, last week with regards to um, never having heard this idea that a married couple are consecrated which is what I spoke about a little bit last week. So look what it, the church teaches. So two other sacraments, these are the last two now that the catechism walks through. Holy orders, or ordination of the priesthood and matrimony, are directed towards the salvation of others. Just let that sink in. So again, back to last week, why do you want to get married? I thought I'd get a lot out of it. <laughs> why do you want to be a priest? thought I'd get a lot out of it. <clears throat> incorrect. That is not what we're looking for. It's about the other. So I want to, what we're looking for in marriage prep is why do you want to marry Susie? Well, because of all the people I've ever met in my life, I don't want to pour my life out for anybody like I want to pour my life out for Susie. And somehow the paradox in that is, and in doing that, I find happiness. That's the idea. So similarly for a priest. So it's oriented towards others. If they contribute as well to personal salvation, it's through service to others that they do so. So remember the Lord, I shared with you that rather um, kind of embarrassing um, encounter I had with the Lord when I was so upset about all the funerals I was doing the one week, and the Lord just kind of bawled me out and said, what are you complaining about? Like, you love doing this. So I, I find life giving. I get exhausted sometimes, but I find life giving. Just like a mom finds life giving. You get exhausted, but I find life giving. Like it's a, it's not just like it's a rush or a thrill. It's life giving. Why? Because that's how we're made. We're constructed that way. Because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Who's God? God is three. God's relationship is one of this constant outpouring of self one to the other. I'm made in his image. You're made in his image. To the degree that I live like that, I'll find happiness to the degree that I try to take. I'll never find happiness. I'll find pleasure. I'll find excitement. I'll find a momentary thrill. But then I quickly become hungry again, okay? So sticking with marriage and uh, holy orders, they confer a particular mission in the church and serve to build up the people of God. 1535, through these sacraments, those already consecrated by baptism and confirmation. So the purpose of baptism is for me. Okay, baptism is, it brings me out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It brings me freedom from sin, makes me to be an adopted son or daughter of the Father. Um, it's, a, it's for me. Confirmation's not for me. Confirmation's for others. Confirmation also is a, a commissioning. It's a sending out. So those of us who've already been baptized, who are preparing for confirmation, whether you were baptized as a Catholic, and now you're going to complete the sacraments of initiation, or you were baptized in another Christian faith or, or a tradition, and now you're going to receive the sacrament of confirmation, that's for others. The whole purpose of being confirmed, remember, is to be driven out by the Spirit to tell others of what God has done in Jesus. And so... Who did confirmation? Father John? Father Prentice? Somebody, right? We haven't done it. <laughs> We're doing it now, all right? So, you know, I just make a little note. Like, confirmation's all about Pentecost. So if you want to know what confirmation's about, just make a note, Acts chapter 2. 
Confirmation is being sent out to tell others about the difference that God has made in Jesus, done for us in Jesus, okay? So those already consecrated by baptism and confirmation, uh, now for the common, in, in the, they become members of the common priesthood of all the faithful. Now they can receive particular consecrations. That's what the church is saying. Those who receive the sacrament of holy orders are consecrated in Christ's name to feed the church by the word and grace of God. That's what I'm sent to do as a priest. And Christian spouses are fortified and, as it were, note that word, huh, consecrated for the duties and dignity of their state by a special sacrament. So we've already touched when we talked about baptism that every one of us here is a priest by baptism. So remember that? Priest, baptism makes us to share in, that's the more, or participate in, would be a more accurate way to say it maybe. Jesus is um, one priesthood, his one prophetic role or mission or life, and his one kingship. So everybody by baptism shares in Christ's priesthood. Before I was ordained a priest and started wearing a collar, I was already a priest by baptism. But this priesthood and that priesthood are different kinds of priesthoods, as we'll see. And then we further said that, um, kind of based on Romans chapter 12, where St. Paul encourages the faithful, offer yourselves, therefore, as a living sacrifice to God. Um, that the, the task of priesthood, what priests do in its most basic sense, have priests offer sacrifices, which is, you know, kind of like two words which put together literally mean to make holy. That's what a sacrifice is about, making something holy. So the sacrifice that all of us by baptism are um, both expected to make of God and equipped by God to do is to offer him the sacrifice of our life. You gave me my life. I give it back. Whatever you want to do, I will do. That's, that's what a Christian's life is supposed to be all about. Lord, I will do whatever you want. Father Pierre belongs to, so, so one of the questions had to do with kind of brothers, friars, um, religious order priests or whatnot. Father Pierre belongs to a um, religious community known as the Companions of the Cross. So I'm a diocesan priest, which means I'm bound to a bishop in a territory. He's a religious priest, so he's bound to a community, and they can send him anywhere in the world. And the founder of his community used to say over and over again, Lord, I will do whatever you want. That's a Christian's life. That's not supposed to be the life of a priest, ordained priest, or a woman in a habit. That's supposed to be normal Christianity. Not extraordinary Christianity. Not Christianity for the, the, for the elite. Normal Christianity is being able to say to the Lord, I will do whatever you want. And I trust you. Because you're a good father. And so we're, always, we're often afraid, like, well, maybe he's going to ask me to do something I don't want to do. It's uncanny how often that happens, you know? So, uh, for example, with priesthood, a man begins to have an experience of conversion, and and the, or a woman begins to experience a uh, conversion, and, and neither one of them are married, and they kind of like, oh, no, like, I hope God doesn't call me to priesthood. And now we say, well, picture this. I mean, do you think God would say um, to a man, do you see um, her over there, you know? Yeah, I see her over there. Um, so imagine God saying this. So I know you find her to be repulsive, and... Um, she just annoys you to no end, but um, I'd like you to marry her and uh, just suck it up for like 45 years or so, and then, and then I'll, I'll give you heaven. God doesn't do that. Like, that's not how it works. You know, like, I know you hate her, but would, would you just do this for me? And it, you laugh because you go, well, of course not. That's just stupid, Right. Well, in a similar way, God doesn't do that with priesthood. Like, I know you find this to be abhorrent, and it would just kill you to do it, but would you please do it for me? Just suck it up. No, that's not how it works. You, you find yourself, 
You marry somebody, at least in theory, right? Because there's some desire and attraction. And what most people don't see is that a similar kind of thing that moves a man or a woman to get married is what moves us to give everything to God. So I look at those of you who are married, and all I see is less. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you don't have the time that I have to give myself to the Lord and to his people. I don't know. I, I would die internally. And you look at me, and you go, less. I don't know how you do it. And that's why you're married, and I'm ordained. Seriously. So a friend of mine, he's, uh, he's the rector of the seminary. He was in the, uh, he was flying somewhere. This was years ago now, I think. He was about the same age as I am, ordained the same number of years. He's sitting in an airport. He's in civ civilian clothes, you know, and he's sitting there in the waiting room, and there's um, a family there, kind of like a mom and a dad, and they got five, six, seven kids. They're all like 10 and under, and they're running around like crazy, and they're being kids, right? They're just spitting up, they're playing games, they're throwing things, things are getting thrown at him, he's fine with it, he's playing back and forth, you know. So they, they kind of nod, recognize each other, whatever. He gets on the plane, and he's sitting in this aisle. It's like three, four, three, and he's like, there is nobody here. And I get to stretch out. And then he starts looking around, and the family's not on the plane. <laughs> and he starts panicking. <laughs> And he's like, oh, no. <laughs> sure enough, they fill up the seats, right? And so it's like, maybe it's 2 4 two, or 2 5 two. It's an international flight. So he's sitting there. He's got, he's in the middle section. He's, he's got, you know, like a young boy next to him, a young girl next to him, the dad here holding an infant, and somebody else on the aisle. And, you know, they're throwing things back and forth, and somebody hits him in the head with a ball. And, I mean, it's just pandemonium, right? And the, um, the dad finally looks at me, he says, so uh, what do you do? <laughs> and my friend says, uh, I'm a priest. And the guy looks at me, he goes, wow, what a sacrifice. And my friend looked at him and went, you got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what you see in us that looks like um, Lack we see in you. And so we are called to serve and work together. That's how it works. Okay? So we're all called to, to hand to the Lord our lives. So th the simple point that we just want to make here is the purpose behind um, priesthood is service. Flip, if you will, to um, First Peter. This was yesterday's first reading. Whenever I think of um, trying to talk about priesthood, there's a set of things that we want to make sure we talked about. Some of them we ask, we're going to get to celibacy. Why is it reserved to men? One of them is the nature of authority. So ours is a culture which is in desperate need of relearning what it means to have authority. We've made the mistake of equating authority with power. Um, that's certainly what's happening in our country right now. I'm out of power, I want it back. I'm in power, isn't it too bad? But that's not the purpose of authority. So yesterday's first reading, 1 Peter 5, here's what Peter writes. So I exhort the elders among you, or the presbyters among you. So he's, he's, he's really writing, this, this is the apostle Peter huh, writing to priests. As a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Tend the flock of God that is in your charge. Or some translations have, God's flock is in your midst. Give it a shepherd's care. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, 
not as domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, huh, is manifested, you will obtain the unfading crown of glory. Flip um, to Mark chapter 10. This, this is, I think, the single most um, powerful passage on authority that I know of. So Mark 10, starting in verse 35. So here's a story of um, the Lord's with the 12. So remember, the Lord has, which this is um, appropriate for the discussion of holy orders. So the Lord has a large contingent of followers. From that large contingent, after a night spent in prayer, he picks 12, who he calls first to be with him, and then he gives them his own authority to go out and to heal, to drive out demons, to proclaim the gospel. But their primary mission is to be with him in a unique way, in an intimate way. And so among the 12, even within the 12, so big group, 12, within the 12, there's three that he's particularly close to, Peter, James, and John. They alone, for example, are witnesses to um, the event called the Transfiguration. When Jesus um, lets his divinity be seen for the only time before his resurrection. They're the only ones with him when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and the night he's betrayed. They're the closest to him. Um, one of the miracles where he raises somebody from the dead, they're the only ones with him. So the, this is kind of like the inner core of the inner core. And even within the inner core, there's one. And you can say, well, is that Peter or is that John? <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. And yet none of these guys are equal to the, the greatness of Mary, who is a woman. Note that. Okay. That'll be significant when we get back to um, the question of why is it only men. So the Lord's um, got the 12. They're um, out somewhere. And along comes uh, James and John. So James and John... You know, John often gets depicted as this kind of rather effeminate guy, long flowing hair, um, whatever. John's nickname, together with his brother, is a son of thunder. John, at one point, when he sees people doing something, he says, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to consume them? Uh, this is no effeminate man. And he's the one who's closest to Jesus. So James and John are jockeying for position in this passage like we often do. New pastor moves into a parish, and people try to get on his agenda quickly. New boss shows up at work. You make a beeline to make sure you can get together and talk with them. I wanna, I wanna get in close, right? I wanna make myself known. That's what we do as fallen creatures because I want something good to come from me here. So James and John are saying to Jesus, Lord, when you come, I mean, when, when, when everything is revealed and everybody comes to see who you are, can we sit at your right and your left? We want the positions of honor. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking me. And then he asks him, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? The baptism that Jesus is going to be baptized with is his death. But they don't understand that. They look at him and they go, we can. He says, you will. At which point, if I'm one of the other ten, I'm like, glad I didn't do that. <laughs> that doesn't sound good, right? And then everybody hears what's going on and they get, they get upset with James and John because they realize what they're doing. They're trying to get in close. They're trying to nudge them out as they get in close. So here's what Jesus says. When the ten heard it, they became indignant. This is verse 41. Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. Or in one translation it says, Their great men make their authority felt. And then he goes on to say, It is cannot be like that with you.
That's what we see with people in authority, right? That's, that's power. That's the mistaking of authority for power. When I mistakenly think, I don't have authority, I have power, what do I do? I'm going to wield it. I'm in charge, you're not. If you were in charge, you could make the rules, but you're not. Want to do something about it? Replace me. That's how we understand authority. Misunderstand authority, right? Not true? Oftentimes? We experience this on like every level, right? How come I have to be home at 10? I'm your mom, I said so. How come the speed limit's whatever? Because we're the lawmakers and we said so. How come the tax code's whatever? Because we made it. We experience people wielding power, making their authority felt over and over again. Coaches, teachers, politicians, pastors, you name it. But Jesus says, that ain't authority. And that's not what I've given you. The purpose of authority, so authority comes from um, a Latin word which, which at its root huh, means to give increase to. So the purpose of authority is so that those who are entrusted to your care can flourish. That doesn't mean so that those entrusted to your care can do whatever they want. That's not flourishing. So there are reasons that a parent says no. And when a child's young, it's simply no. When a child gets to a certain age, it's no, here's the reason why. But that's all done out of love, right? At least it's supposed to be. There's reasons why teachers, coaches, politicians, priests, ministers, whatever, they, th their whole purpose is to lead those who have been entrusted to them to have a fuller life. That is the purpose of authority. Does that make sense? That's huge. Not to impose my will. That's not authority. But oftentimes when we, because we've been so burned by people at every level, we tend to look at people who are in positions of authority with suspicion and oftentimes rightly so. Because they don't seem to be exercising authority, they seem to be wielding power. But if you're a parent, if, you have, if you're an employer, if you have people that report to you, if, if you're in any position, of authority, I would beg you to have this passage ingrained in your heart. Um, it's certainly ingrained in mine. I, that's not to say that I do it well all the time. I don't. But it's one of the ways in which I examine my conscience over and over again. I'm just leery uh, of having authority felt. So we're in dire need of knowing that. So priesthood is not about power. Priesthood's about exercising authority. God's flock, Peter says, is in your midst. Give it a shepherd's care. So pray for us, please, huh, that we would be able to do that well. Okay, let's, um, let's keep going through the catechism a little bit just to walk through some things. And then I want to begin to touch on some of those questions that came up, okay? Flip to, um, flip to 1539. So... These, these paragraphs here are simply talking about, remember, we're, we're doing this with rerouting. One of the purposes of rerouting is to see that the entirety of Scripture is a drama. And as with any other great drama, because this is the best of dramas, um, there are things which prepare for other things later on that show up early. One of the things that does that is the nature of the priesthood and the cult of sacrifice in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, at a certain point, there is one of the tribes of the Jewish people who is set aside as priests. Even though all the Jewish people are referred to as, you know, a, a nation of priests, God picks the tribe of Levi, this is paragraph 1539, who are consecrated, and, and they don't get, they don't, all the other tribes, when they move into the promised land, they get land. This tribe doesn't. Their inheritance is God. They're to be cared for by the people. But all of this, what the Catechism is trying to show, is this paves the way for what Jesus is going to do. So look at 1540 really quick. So instituted, still talking about the Old Testament priests, huh? 
instituted to proclaim the word of God and to restore communion with God by sacrifices and prayer, this priesthood nevertheless remains powerless to bring about salvation. So in the Old Testament, there are, this is one of the things we're going to talk about when we get to um, uh, the section on Exodus and rerouting. It looks like Old Testament filled with all this sacrifice, and then boom, we get to the New Testament, there's no more sacrifice, and you wonder, well, what the heck was that all about? Well, that's not the case. All those sacrifices find their fulfillment in the one sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, which is actually made present. Again, it's re-presented in the sacrifice of the Mass. But all those sacrifices that were offered all throughout the Old Testament, they couldn't do what they were signifying. You can throw a bull's blood over you all day long. It won't change you. It's not going to do anything for you. But all of a sudden, drinking the blood of the eternal Son of God offered to us in the Eucharist actually can change me. Right? You understand the difference? So the purpose of the sacrifice was to make holy, but you can't kill a cow and have it make me holy. But that was prefiguring this, Jesus on the cross and his one sacrifice for all of us. And that can make me holy. That's what God wants to do in my life. So the Old Testament priesthood foreshadows the New Testament priesthood. The Old Testament sacrifices foreshadow the New Testament sacrifices, and they're all, or the New Te Testament sacrifice, and it all finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Does that make sense? It's huge to understand. So, 1544, just flip to that real quick if you wouldn't mind. Everything that the priesthood of the Old Covenant prefigured finds its fulfillment in Christ Jesus, the one mediator between God and men. The Christian tradition considers Melchizedek, who's this rather obscure figure who actually shows up a lot in the New Testament, or several times, I should say, priest of God Most High as a prefiguration of the priesthood of Christ, the unique high priest after the order of Melchizedek, holy, blameless, unstained, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, that is, by the unique sacrifice of the cross. So everything, everything in the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus. It's all pointing to him including the priesthood in the Old Testament and the sacrifices that are offered. Next paragraph, just real quick. The redemptive sacrifice of Christ is unique, accomplished once for all, and yet it's made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice of the church. The same is true of the one priesthood of Christ. It's present through the ministerial priesthood without diminishing the uniqueness of Christ's priesthood. If you can think back to the beginning of um, becoming Catholic, when we were upstairs in the church, we were talking about the Mass. And one of the things that we tried to put forth is, as you're trying to understand why we make the emphasis on the Mass that we do, for a Catholic, the purpose, the reason for which we come to Mass is not so much of what we want to give to God. You can pray anywhere and should. You can sing anywhere and should. You can read the scriptures anywhere and should. The reason we come to Mass as Catholics is primarily because of what God wants to do in us. What does he want to do in us? He wants to conform me to his son. How's that going to happen? It's going to happen objectively, concretely, tangibly, sensually through the sacraments. Most especially by the reception of his body and his blood. Which I eat and drink. And because it's not an image or a symbol or a figure, but is truly him, it has the potential, if I receive it openly and in grace, to change my life. 
which takes me out of having to you know, conjure up some emotional response. I just don't get anything when I go to church. Really? You mean other than the body and blood of Jesus, which has the potential to turn dead to life and darkness to light? You mean other than that? Oh, yeah, I guess other than that. Because we're so used to chasing feelings, right, and experiences. And that's a dangerous way to live. If I lived on feelings, I'd be in jail, and I wouldn't be a priest. And I'd probably be dead, quite honestly. Okay, does that make sense? So all fulfilled in the person of Jesus and his sacrifice can actually accomplish what all those sacrifices in the Old Testament pointed to but could never do. All right. Um, let's keep going. So 15, um, 1546 just talks about how, you know, we're all priests by baptism. 1547, the ministerial or hierarchical priesthood of bishops and priests and the common priesthood of all the faithful participate each in its own way in the one priesthood of Christ. While being ordered one to another, they differ essentially. So I'm not different by, um, as an ordained priest by degree, I'm different in kind is the way to think about that. In what sense? While the common priesthood of the faithful is exercised by the unfolding of baptismal grace, a life of faith, hope, and charity, a life according to the Spirit, that's what we all are called to by baptism, the ministerial priesthood is at the service of the common priesthood. So the only reason I'm ordained a priest is to care for you. It's not for what you can do for me. It's to care for you. How do I care for you? I act like a mailman. That's how I would think about it. Like, I'm in a long line of people who have delivered the gospel, and I'm just supposed to, like, receive it and hand it on. I'm not supposed to receive it and go, I don't like that page. That's stupid. I'm going to write this in. I think we should do this. Here, try that. No, now I've forgotten my task, right? My mission is simply... And in fact, what a priest, when he's made a pastor, sorry, Mary's flying around here. Um, when a priest is made a pastor of a parish, he signs on an altar, on a Bible, in front of the congregation, an oath of fidelity, promising that he will faithfully hand on all that the church teaches with regards to faith and morals. I swore an oath to God that I would do that. So it's not up to me to go, eh, I think we're going to skip the, like, contraception thing or the homosexuality thing or the abortion thing or care for the poor thing or the ecology thing or whatever. Nah. I got enough to answer for. Trust me, with sin, I ain't going to answer for lying to y'all. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's the ordained priest's task. Receive and hand on. The Latin word for that is tradition. That's what tradition means to faithfully hand on, okay? So at the service of the common priesthood, the ministerial priesthood is directed at the unfolding of the baptismal grace of all Christians. It's a means by which Christ unceasingly builds up and leads his church. Leads it where? To fulfillment. To true happiness. And for this reason, it's transmitted by its own sacrament, the sacrament of holy orders. So that's my task. You know, that's Father John's task, Father Prentice's task. Pray, please, that we will be able to do that. There are, um, maybe just to be aware of, within um, the understanding of holy orders, there is a, a ranking, okay, or a hierarchy within uh, ordination. Bishop, priest, and deacon. So... Um, the way the church would teach it would be that only a bishop actually has the fullness of holy orders. Um, the only reason that there are priests is because the bishop can't be everywhere in his territory at the same time. So I exercise the authority that has been given to me by virtue of the bishop, or in our case, the archbishop, giving me the authority to do that. So I can't hear confessions unless he gives me the authority to do that. I can't validly celebrate Mass unless he gives me the authority to do that. And there are some people that he takes that away from. So the bishop has the fullness of orders. The priest is an extension of the bishop. And then the deacon is, um, uh, can 
assists, he's actually ordained, huh? and he assists the priest and the bishop in lots of different things, most especially caring for the poor and assisting at the altar. Now, you might wonder, um, like, where's that all come from? Um, Ignatius of Antioch is um, one of the, what we call the early apostolic fathers, which is to say these are the, the men who knew the apostles and learned from the apostles. Ignatius dies in the early second century in Rome. And in, um, as he's being led to Rome from Syria um, to be executed in um, uh, the capital of the empire, he writes all these letters. And in one of the letters, he starts talking about bishops, priests, and deacons. It's, it's in a letter to the um, Tralians, I think it is. It's footnoted in, um, uh, it's footnote number 27 on paragraph 1549. If you look up that footnote, if you look up that citation uh, online, you'll see Ignatius says, without these three things, bishop, priest, and deacons, you can't even begin to speak of a church. So there, there is no church, formally speaking, without the orders of bishop, priest, and deacon. Why? Because in order for a church to be a church, you have to be able to celebrate the Eucharist. In order to help be able to celebrate the Eucharist, you need a validly ordained bishop. That is to say, a successor of the apostles, because you can't just wake up one day and go, I think I'm going to celebrate Mass today in my living room. Why? Because I need authority to do that. Who can give me the authority to do that? Those who received the authority from Jesus, who are they? They're the apostles. What did they do? They handed it on to their successors. What do we call them? Bishops. Remember Father Prentice early on, he, came, he was talking about how he, the, the question for him, what, what began to prompt his movement towards the Catholic Church unknowingly was a conversation he had with one of his other, kind of his co-pastor at the church where he was pastoring. And the question was something to the effect of, I forget exactly how he asked it, but it was something like, Did, have, do you ever wonder like, where we get the authority to do what we do? And the man said something to the effect of all the time. And he says, and? He says, I don't know. He says, I don't either, and I'm beginning to get nervous. At the end of the day, um, the question really is all about authority. Like, who has the authority to tell you this is the word of God? Who has the authority to tell you that the shepherd of Hermas, which is an ancient document, is not inspired? It's inspirational, but it's not inspired. Who told you that these books and not others are the Bible? Who told you what baptism is? Who, who could possibly tell us that the Eucharist is this and not that, or that baptism means this and not that? How do you know? And you say, well, it would be great if we could ask Jesus. And you go, well, you can actually. How? Because you can talk to those who he appointed to carry on his ministry. Who are they? The apostles. Where are they? They're alive. Where? In the bishops. Sinful um, and as bungling as they may be, just like you and me. But Jesus didn't promise them they weren't going to be sinful. <laughs> Jesus just said, faithfully hand on what I'm going to do or what I'm telling you. And quite honestly, the constant um, manifestation of the sinfulness of not just bishops, priests, and deacons, but, you know, you all, is really wonderful proof that this has got to be God's doing or we would have imploded centuries ago, right? People leave the church when they see priest scandals. I always think, gosh, why don't I leave the church when I walk out of a confessional? All I do is hear scandalous behavior. I'm done with you people. <laughs> You know, gosh, bunch of hypocrites, phony frauds, sitting there on church on Sunday. Here you are on Saturday again, saying the same damn thing you said. You know, <laughs> isn't that what you say about priests? What a fraud. We never think that about you. Yeah, really. Why are you held to a lesser standard? There's nothing in Scripture that says you're held to a lesser standard. You're called to be holy. I'm called to be holy, period. No difference. 
you're in your state of life, I'm in my state of life. You mess up, I mess up. I don't make mistakes, I rebel. You don't make mistakes, you rebel. And what does God do? He forgives. And what do we do? What are we enabled to do as a result of that? Go tell others about how merciful he is. How do we know that? Not because we read it in a book, because we've experienced it. The, the whole kind of, to me, it's the idiocy of holding certain people to one standard and others to another standard. There are not two standards. You are called to greatness. I am called to greatness. It's enough to keep me occupied. It's enough to keep you occupied. Let's pray for each other. And when people fall, I expect it. Why? Because I know the human condition. I know mine, and I know enough of yours. That's why we need a redeemer. And the church is not the club of those who are like, hey, man, we got it all together. Come celebrate with us on Saturday and Sunday and check out our coffee and donuts. The church is the people who've woken up and realized, I'm in desperate need of a redeemer. How about you? Good. I think I have a place where we can find him. And we don't just learn about him, but he actually does something within us. What's he do? He makes us holy. How does he do that? He gives us himself to eat. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's what the church is. Okay. Don't know how we got onto that. Okay, la -da -da. let's keep going. Um, 1551, if you want a paragraph to keep in mind to pray for us. So the church teaches priesthood's ministerial. It is in a strict sense a term of service. It is entirely related to Christ and to men. It depends entirely on Christ and on his unique priesthood. It has been instituted for the good of men and the communion of the church. The exercise of this authority must therefore be measured against the model of Christ, who by love made himself the least and servant of all. Good luck with that. That's why we need people to pray for us. But if you're a married man, your model is what? It's Jesus on a cross. Same model as mine. If you're a married woman, what's your model? It's Jesus on a cross. Same model as mine. So we, we want to be on our knees, lifting each other up, praying for each other, especially those people that we know are struggling whatever way that they might be. All right, let's look at two last things. We'll take a little break. Um, let's talk about um, only men. So... Um, this is in the section of uh, 1577, 1578. So um, people often wonder, you'll hear people talk in different situations, um, and they'll ask the question, is it, w certainly, I mean, it's going to be a reality, right? Where we're going to ordain women. Um, no, period, end of story, it will never happen. It can't. Certainly there's a possibility we're going to have married priests. Yep, could be. In fact, there are already. And not just Eastern Rite. Um, one's a law. That's the second one. So the church tomorrow could change the law in the Latin church that um, a priest is celibate. In the Eastern church, like Chad said, um, priests do marry. Those paragraphs 1579 um, and 1580 talk about that. 1580 especially. 1579 is about deacons. Um, but I have um, Eastern Rite friends um, so there's, what, 24 some odd rites in the Catholic Church. We're Latin rites, but there's lots of Eastern rites where they marry. But I also have friends who are Latin rite Catholic priests who are married. They were ministers in another denomination. They became Catholic. They were married. They petitioned to Rome to allow them to get ordained, and they're ordained. The chaplain at um, Hillsdale, if you know anybody who goes to Hillsdale, um, is a married Catholic priest. He was, I think he was Anglican before, I think. I'm not sure about that. But there's a whole variety of them. It's more in Lansing than there are. I don't know anybody in Detroit, actually. I'm not sure that there is any, or that there are any. Um, but that's a law that could change tomorrow. 
Um, in a lot of ways, I wish it would. Here's why I wish it would. I wish it would because then it would, um, because most of us wouldn't get married. In fact, nobody that I know would get married. Because if you're a priest, most of your time is spent doing marriage counseling, and if most of your time is spent doing marriage counseling, you're not sitting there going, oh, I think that's the solution. <laughs> nope. <laughs> that ain't the solution. <laughs> so m most priests just wouldn't marry, and not because of that, right? Um, they wouldn't marry because um, it doesn't fit our life it, for most of us. How in the world would I do it in a parish like this? How would you pay me, first of all? Right? I'm a, I'm a celibate, consecrated man. I can live on $24,000 a year. Not with, a, not with kids and a wife. Saturday comes. I'm looking at Danny CYO. So Saturday comes. There's, you know, four football games. There's a couple of volleyball games. There's a bowling match, and I'm trying to figure out whose kids' games I'm going to go see. Whose kids' games do you think I'm going to go see? I'm going to go see my kids' games. Heck with your kids. All right? People walk into my office. My wife comes by late at night and says, hey, I saw that Susie was talking to you again. What you want? <laughs> I can't tell you that. Hmm. She's been in a lot lately. I'm serious. How's that going to work? Poorly. Now, if I'm in a little tiny parish, would it be nice sometimes to have a wife and a, can and a family? Sure. Middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning some nights, would it be nice to have someone next to me? Sure. But most priests wouldn't marry. If it was removed and most people saw it and saw us live in a celibate life, I think the sign value, I'm just speaking personally right now, I think the sign value would be understood more intensely. The challenge is, how do you do that without looking like you've capitulated to a culture that is just hypersexual? And I don't know how you do that. So, you know, I'm not sitting here waiting for the law to change. Ordination of men is a different story. That's not a law. That has to do with the very nature of a sacrament. So the way that, and, and this has been, I don't care who you hear talk about it, whether it's a, another priest or, you know, a man or a woman who teaches somewhere in a church or a friend of yours or somebody who's saying some story about Pope Francis or whatever, it can't change. It can't change any more than one day I'm going to wake up and go, you know what, I love Oreos. I think today at Mass, we're going to consecrate Oreos. I'm going to do Oreos and yoo I don't have any unleavened bread. All I got are Oreos. So surely God wouldn't want us to be deprived of the Eucharist, so. And we got the double stuff. <laughs> so we're getting big Jesus, right? Like, I can't do that. Or if I'm on an island and someone's sitting there, I mean, you know, like we're in the middle of an internal part of an island, so I'm not around the water, and someone says, I think I want to be baptized. And I'm like, okay, great, I'd love to baptize you. I got some Crisco. I got some paint. I got some turpentine. I'm going to use the Crisco. I can't baptize you in Crisco. Can't baptize you in oil, even though oil is of a higher value than water, not maybe so much for life. I, I can only baptize you in water. Why? Because that's what Jesus instituted. I can only consecrate bread and wine. Why? Because that's what Jesus instituted. In order to confirm, I need oil. Why? Because that's the matter of the sacrament. Why is the ordination of priests limited to men? Because that's what Jesus instituted. Yeah, but, I mean, he was, you know, a product of his time. He was kind of culturally bound by the first century norms. Huh. Really? Well, that's a problem. If I got a God who's culturally bound by the norms of his time, that ain't much of a God, right? And, oh, by the way, that just doesn't square with the evidence of Scripture. He's breaking norms all the time. Samaritan woman at the well, Father Prentice used that story on retreat, right? He get into the fact that men and women don't talk to each other privately, ever, in the Middle East, unless it's your spouse. Let alone a Samaritan woman and a Jewish man. Jesus could give a flip about cultural norms. He's not bound by those. He's God, for crying out loud. 
So he's not culturally bound. So what is it about a man? It can't be that a man is better, right? It can't be. Why, why, why would we say that? Because the greatest human person who ever lived, the model for every single Christian in terms of discipleship, is a woman. The greatest saint is a woman. The person I'm supposed to imitate in my response to Jesus is a woman who says to the Lord, I'm yours, do whatever to me you want to do to me. That's Mary. Mary's the greatest human person who ever lived. Jesus is a divine person. He's a human nature, but he's a divine person. Mary is the greatest human person that ever lived. There's nobody close. She's my model. So it can't have to, anything to do with dignity or worth. And it doesn't have anything to do with justice. It seems like an injustice, right? That's how it's often presented for many people. It's just not right. Well, what's justice? Justice is giving to somebody what they're due. Hmm. Am I, is anybody due priesthood? No. Like, just because I am a man doesn't mean I have a right to be a priest. So the question was asked about discernment and whatnot. You know, so, you know, you call up or meet with the person who's in charge of, you know, recruiting, if you will, and then begins this long process. And trust me, in that long process, many men are asked to leave. Yeah, but I'm a man. That's nice. But you're not a priest. But I really feel like it inside. Well, that's great. You're not. Yeah, but I really think God's calling me to this. No, he's not. Well, who are you? We're the church. Oh. Okay. And we've discerned with you that this is not what God's asking of you. Here's the reasons why. In the same way that, you know, I propose to somebody and go, I want you to marry me. Yeah, but I don't want to marry you. Yeah, but I want to marry you. No, oh, that's nice, but you're not what I'm looking for. No, 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 I, I really think we should be together. <laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> what do you do with that? You, you, you don't get married, <laughs> right? So no one has a right to this. So uh, this has been definitively settled. So John Paul, um, St. John Paul the Great, definitively settled it. After he wrote about it to settle it, it's, it's not like he just woke up one day and went, you know what, heck with women. They're a pain in the neck. No women priests. You know, it's based on the whole, it's, it's based on the scriptures, the constant tradition of the church. It, it, it's, he, he pronounces that this has been infallibly decided by the church. Then someone wrote to Rome and said, did they really mean that? And he went, yeah. And then people continue to ask questions, but did he really, really mean it? So it's a done matter. Here's the, here's the key. Why? Um, there's still a lot to mine with this, quite honestly. It has something to do with marriage, which is why it's really hard to understand right now. So, um, there's a... Uh, both a talk and an article on our website that I think is probably 15 years old now, maybe even longer than that. But you can look at called um, something like "I'm Reserving the Priesthood to Men" or something like that that I gave years and years ago. Um, but it might be worth listening to if you've got questions about this. Jesus is. Um, identifies himself as, and is identified by John the Baptist as what? Don't think Lamb of God. That's true, but that's not what I'm looking at. Not a priest. Not a bishop. That's true, but that's not what I'm looking for. Guess what's in my mind. That's the game we're playing. Guess what's in my mind. Bridegroom. John says about Jesus, when the best man, the paraphrase, would be when the best man sees the bride and the groom together, 
he retreats. That's what Jesus is identified by as John. Jesus says about fasting, so long as the bridegroom is with them, wedding guests can't fast, but the day will come when the bridegroom, that's him, will be taken away. On that day, they'll fast. Until a couple of years ago, we seemed to know with common sense that only a man can be a bridegroom. We don't know that anymore. That's part of the reason why we don't understand why only a man can be a priest. There's something, we, we have, we have, um, we have a lot of work to do in trying to understand the meaning behind gender. That's a much deeper topic than right now, but we have, we have lost our moorings with regards to reality. And as a result of that, we're in a mess. That's not to say anything about anybody who's struggling in whatever way with whatever they're struggling with. That's not the point. It's just that there was once a time when we were able to, un when we didn't see our nature as somehow confining and limiting and restricting, we saw it as a given from God and it was good. And we understood that a man and a woman actually fit together. <laughs> they fit together in an absolutely unique way. Like only a man and a woman can become one reproducing organism. No other combination works. We just kind of knew that. Now we don't care about that. But that says something about the relationship between men and women. And somehow uh, uh, an understanding of gender, and an, an understanding of the significance that Jesus is male, which is not a slight on women, for crying out loud. Priests are not... Um, Ask this question. Who knows the name of the Bishop of Calcutta? Anybody at all? Anybody ever heard of Mother Teresa? Who do you think had more influence? Mother Teresa. I don't even know who you are. Who are you? It's not about uh, Archbishop Chaput in um, Philadelphia. He was asked the question once about how is it that only men are ordained? And his answer was a great answer. He says, tell me what you think priesthood is and I'll answer your question. If it's only men get to make the powerful decisions, then we got a problem. But remember, this is a sacrament of service. And quite frankly, most parishes are staffed predominantly by women. My closest assistant in this parish, my, my, I shouldn't even say it that way, the person that I work more intimately with than anybody have for the last 15 years, 16 years, is a woman. She compliments me and I compliment her. I've never worked with anybody like her. And I would be much less than what I am or who I am without her. So it doesn't have anything to do with getting to make the rules. See, that's, that's that understanding of authority as power again, which is not what it's about. It's about authority. It's about leading others. <laughs> Does it make sense to keep, you know, driving home the distinction between authority and power? Does that resonate with people? As we keep going through this, does that help? I hope. If you have a position of authority, um, you are one day going to answer for it. Like you shouldn't be longing for authority. Those who have authority are going to have to answer for more. That's why, again, we need to pray for the people who are in authority, whether it's in politics or in the church or wherever the level might be, right? 
God give them the strength they need, the wisdom they need, the prudence that they need, the courage that they need, the charity that they need, whatever the case might be, right? Because St. Augustine, you know, this um, famous um, uh, father of the church from the 5th century would often say, you know, with you, I'm a sheep. That's for my good. For you, I'm a shepherd, and that makes me tremble. Because I'm going to have to answer for being a shepherd. So we want to pray for those in positions of authority. Pray for the Holy Father right now. Pray that God will give them courage and wisdom, keep them faithful to what it is that God's asking them to do and to be. Um, pray for the Archbishop here in Detroit. Pray for Father John and me and Father Prentice and Father Pierre. Trust me, we need it. Because we're praying for you. Okay? Okay. A um, question was asked about uh, deaconesses. Great question. Can, um, has there ever been deaconesses, and could that happen again? Because this, this has come up, you know, it's been in the news and whatnot. Francis has, has uh, talked about it. <coughs> There's a, a German scholar named, um, I think his name is Manfred Hauke. That's how he pronounces it. H-A-U-K-E. Um, he did his dissertation on, um, I think, it's more reserved to the issue of uh, the ordination of women to the priesthood. But he touches on the issue of deaconesses in there. So if, um, I'm just trying to drop off the top of my head if I can on this, but um, there's several things um, about this. Could happen. So far as I know, if I remember correctly, um, um, the prayer that was uttered, first there's the reason why there were deaconesses, and then there's the prayer. So the prayer that's uttered over a woman who was um, installed as a deacon was not a consecration. It wasn't an ordination. It was, a, it was something less than an ordination, if you will. So it was a different kind than the prayer that was uttered over a man who was ordained a deacon. Um, so uh, the ordination prayer, we, we would say, changes you ontologically, so like on the level of your being. Um, someone becomes configured to Christ the priest. So you were, you were ontologically changed when you were baptized. So your soul was imprinted, if you will. Try to picture that. Um, so a, a deaconess in the early church, and there were deaconesses, um, was not ordained. The reason for deaconesses, I'm not sure that this is exclusive. Um, I'd have to go back and do more research, quite honestly. But the primary reason, if I can remember correctly, why there were deaconesses had to do with modesty. Because um, you would baptize naked. Hey, let's do that again. <laughs> you know, so um, we don't do that, obviously, so don't panic, those of you who have been baptized. Um, full immersion and you're naked. All right, so, yeah, we're not doing that. Um, <laughs> and it's not videotaped, so don't worry. Um, but s for simple modesty, especially in a Middle Eastern culture, um, you would never have a man do that. You would have a woman do that, for a woman. And so you had deaconesses who would assist in doing that. Okay? There's more in it to, into it than that, but, um, you know, again, people see conversations like this. They crop up on lots of things. You know, Francis is moving the church into a more, you know, liberal, progressive, 21st century, whatever, mindset. No, Francis's task is to be faithful to what it is that God asked him to be, which is to hand on the deposit of faith. Pray that he will do that. Um, so he can't just make up, you know, like, we're going to do double stuff for Oreos this weekend. Not happening. And we're not ordaining women. Even though I like Oreos a lot better than unleavened bread. Um, so, so deaconesses uh, could happen, but I don't know that there's a logistic reason, at least in this country, for something like that, and I don't know what function they would serve, quite honestly. And I don't need a woman to be a deaconess. Um, I need women to do a lot of other things, but I don't need people to assist at the altar. I mean, it, that's not our issue. So we'll have to wait and see what goes on with that, quite honestly. But it probably wouldn't be an ordination. Um, comment was made earlier, or the question was asked about uh, brothers, sisters, and whatnot. So those, those women, who, so we have, we pray a lot for our 
you know, we have four guys going into the seminary. We've got a couple other guys who are discerning going into the seminary. We pray for them a lot. Um, we don't pray as often out loud uh, at Mass, not nearly as often as we should for the women who are in formation. For religious life, we have two... We have We have two women who are in religious life. Um, I think it's only two. And um, they're not ordained, but they're consecrated. So the best way to think of um, women religious are, um, at least the best way I've ever heard of thinking of them, is, is they are the backbone of the church. So... Those who are um, live in religious life do one of they, they live one of two ways. They either live um, cloistered, which means they they don't serve an active apostolic ministry, or they live out in the public. So cloistered. So for example, in Farmington Hills, there's the cloistered Dominicans. So these are women who, out of love for the world, have left the world to pray for the world. One day, when you meet them in heaven, you might realize that they are responsible for your salvation. Not in the way that Jesus is, of course, but because they prayed for you, you responded to his grace. That's all they lived to do. So they didn't go, man, the world's just pathetic. I'm out of here. I'm going to that monastery. They went, the Lord loves the world. I want the world to know him out of love for him and for them. I'm going to the monastery and I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prayer for that world that I love. So there's cloistered Dominicans, there's cloistered Carmelites over in Sterling Heights. Um, there's a, a set of different cloistered orders. Then there are active consecrated men and women. So there's men also who live in monasteries, you know, who don't come out. Um, and then there are active, they might work in education, they might work in healthcare, they might work in, um, you know, kind of like more concrete, what we would call corporal works of mercy, working with the poor. They work in all sorts of different things. So one of the sisters uh, from our parish in religious formation, um, she does, uh, you know, evangelization work with, with the poor. Um, the other one is um, an OBGYN. So one belongs to an order which is really evangelistic. The other belongs to an order where most of them become, um, they, they go and get a doctorate or they become doctors. So some put a huge high premium on ongoing education, high level education, so as to penetrate um, the world at that level and to bring leaven, the leaven of the gospel into that level. Others are working at a different level. Okay, does that help? Does that make some sense? And you never really know who, I mean, if somebody's out, like you don't, you can't tell if Father Pierre belongs to a religious order and that I don't. You just, you have to ask, you know. If you, if you ever go to Rome, like seemingly every other guy is in a collar. And they ain't all priests, trust me. Because uh, as soon as you go into seminary in Rome, you start wearing a collar because they want a visible presence. So um, a friend of mine was flying home one day from Rome and, He's sitting next to some woman, a black woman sitting next to him, and she looks at him and she goes, mm -mm, are you a real thing or are you one of them pretenders? <laughs> <laughs> so you can never tell. You've got to ask them. So people would come up all the time, can you bless this? Uh, no. Well, thanks a lot. You know, or, Father, would you hear my confession? No. Why not? I'm not a priest. Why are you wearing a collar? It's really hard to explain. <laughs> Fraud. You know, so... Um, There's a lot more we could talk about, but is this, is this helpful? Any other thing that comes to mind or questions that people have? Yeah. No, he, he's a successor of the bishops, or the, of the apostles, rather. He doesn't, they don't speak through him. I mean, you want to be careful how you say what you're going to say. Go ahead, ask the question, and I'll try to figure it out. So the Pope's a bishop. He's the bishop of Rome. Okay, he's the successor of St. Peter. Okay, so 
Yeah, but he has, just like Peter has a preeminent role amongst the apostles, so does um, the Holy Father. So Peter's task, uh, in a particular way, is to um, ensure unity and to strengthen the brethren. So um, that's his mission, right? It's to Peter that the keys of the kingdom are given. As uh, Pope Benedict put it once, Peter is always, the Pope is always both Peter and Simon. Meaning what? So remember, Peter's not a name. Peter's, Peter's the name for an, an inanimate object. So we heard that last night in the Gospel too, if you were at Mass on the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter. So Peter's given name, his birth name is Simon. Okay? And then as... Uh, and like in Matthew 16, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Or what's the crowd saying about me, right? Well, some people think you're Elijah. Some people think you're John, you know, John the Baptist back from the dead, one of the other prophets. How about you? What do you, what do you think I am? And Simon says, you're the Christ. And Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. That was my father who revealed that to you. And in a similar way that you just identified me as the Christ, I'm telling you, you or Peter, and at that moment he changes his name. And whenever a name's changed in Scripture, it's the, it's the giving of a mission in a particular way. So he's given this mission to be um, rock. In reality, he's the least rock-like of any of the apostles, you could say. But it didn't have anything to do with his qualities. It had to do with the mission which the Lord had given to him. So Benedict would say he was al he's always that person who holds that office is always Peter, given the mission, and Simon, meaning he's weak. He's a weak man. And, and the promise is not that he won't be s sinful. The promise is that he will not teach error. Okay, and then the card cardinal is just an honor. So uh, the purpose of the cardinal, the primary purpose of the cardinals is to elect the pope. That's what they do. That's their primary function. When a pope dies, or in Benedict's case, resigns, um, they uh, come together in a conclave and they elect a new pope. That's their number one, that's their most important function. And um, they all have, um, there was a time when these were the closest um, assistants to the Bishop of Rome, and so they all held the churches that were closest to um, St. Peter's. So every, um, every cardinal is given uh, the care in a particular way of one of the churches in Rome, even if they live in, you know, Kathmandu. So, but that's their primary function is to elect the Pope. It's, it's an honorary title. Yeah. Can a priest be fired? Um, uh, define fired. Can a yeah, a priest can be removed, right? So, um, with cause, if someone has committed, uh, say, could everything from be from serious sin, scandal, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, the with cause, uh, obviously, a person can be removed. Yeah. The priesthood, the, the, the mark that's left, so a priest can be laicized, which would, which would enable him to actually get married. Um, but he is always a priest. I can't imagine. Um, Mother Teresa, in a way, um, so Mother Teresa was this really uh, kind of odd combination of qualities. She was um, diminutive, gentle, uh, and fierce. You know, she was, so my image of Mother Teresa is kind of like that. You know, it's just kind of like stroking your face and then slapping you. So she, she was talking one time, and um, she says, you know, she was talking about the beauty of the priesthood, and understand that you're, a, you know, to be ordained is to be configured to Jesus. You are you will always um, be a priest, even in hell. 
you will be a priest. It's like, <laughs> I mean, if that ain't the epitome of patheticism, I don't know what is. You're, you're now separated eternally from the one that you're ontologically configured to. That would suck, sorry. <laughs> That's the only way I know how to describe that. Um, so, yeah. Anything else? <laughs> On a happier note, <laughs> priests going to hell. It, here, here's what I would say to you. Um, it, maybe I could end with this, if there's no other questions. It's easy for a priest to think that uh, he has a job and that he has a function to do. And trust me, the, the work that most priests have to do because they don't have the staff that they need to care. So a minister can care for, you know, 150 to 200 people. That's what um, most sociological surveys show. So we've got three priests here with 12,000 people. That's why you don't get cared for the way you'd like to be. Because can't, we can't, right? So because of um, the nature of the work and of the demands on time, it's really easy for a priest to stop praying. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with pastors like all around the country who call and want to know about things that you know might be happening here in the Archdiocese of Detroit, whatever. And they want to know, I'm thinking about doing this. Should I do that? You know, like would this be a, like should I bring Alpha there? Like, what are you guys doing with discipleship groups? What's up with this rerouting thing? I mean, you think that would work here? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like, what does the Lord say to you when you pray about your parish? Oh, you know, I um, I don't think I'm praying enough. Yeah, I don't think you are. So the, the primary call of the priest, again, is to be with the Lord. And it's only to the degree that the priest is with the Lord that he's got anything to offer the people. I mean, what in the world would I have to offer anybody? I don't have any answers to anything. But he does. So I would ask you, I mean, I'd beg you, really, um, in your daily prayers, to pray in a special way for those priests, especially in the Archdiocese of Detroit, who do not pray, and that God will bring them back to him. Because until that happens, parishes will never change. We'll just offer programs or events or whatever, and people don't need programs and events. People need Jesus. And... Um, you know, so to be a priest is, and one of the images for me is it's, it's very much like being a physician and you'd be like sitting out, you know, sitting in my office and, you know, Nurse Kathy sitting outside and says, hey, uh, Bob's outside. Tell Bob that uh, he should take a couple of Advil and uh, give him the splint. No, that's not you. Um, it's like, well, but how do you know what Bob needs? Well, I don't know. Let's just give it to him. I mean, he's probably got some pain somewhere and the splint's probably useful. Don't you want to sit down with him? Nah, I don't think I need to do that. Um, these things work for most people. Let's just start there. I think you should probably like examine him first. And so the task of the priest is to be with the Lord, you know, in the chapel and say, Lord, here's the patient, Our Lady Good Counsel. Where is she sick? Where is she healthy? What do we need to do? And then only after that, to do something. That's how we pray as a team when we gather together, um, and especially as a leadership team in the parish. That's how we pray. We pray as if we're nurses and doctors looking at an x-ray. We're just saying, Lord, show us an MRI of the parish. What's sick? What needs attention? What's healthy? And then what do we do? If you don't pray... S same thing applies for parents, right? Getting in front of the Eucharist and saying, Lord, I don't know what to do with my children. I can't see what they need. But you see, you know, so help me to know. And then you act. First you ask, then you listen, then you act. That's the order. Okay, so pray please that, um, that we'll stay faithful to prayer and that those who don't pray and we'll come back and um, begin to pray again. All right? Great. Thanks, everybody.